Bloomberg ringing the opening bell at the New York Stock Exchange for its first day of trading since the storm. I'm Peter Latman reporting for Business Day Live. We'll be checking in with Washington and looking at field reports later in the show. But first, it's been about an hour since trading began in New York. Let's check in with business editor Larry Ingracia for details. Good morning, Larry. Hey, Peter. So, um, no train service, still no electricity downtown, but New York Stock Exchange opened, and what are the early reviews? And so far, so good. You know, volume is up a little bit. That's to be expected because the market's been closed a couple of days. No wild fluctuations. I mean, let's be honest. If the day goes by without a major glitch in trading, New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ, it doesn't matter whether stocks are up or down for the day. I think it'll be uh, considered a success because the big concern was with Everything that's been going on, some of the program trading, we've had problems in the past, you know, communications maybe being disrupted, that something could go wrong if they were rushing to get everything ready to right. go. But so far, so good. It's early in the day. You know, we have, what, you know, seven more hours of trading, but so far, so good. And it's an interesting time of, uh, of the year, right, the end of the month, where you sometimes have window dressing with hedge funds and you have mutual funds with their, you know, month end. Last so. day of trading, a lot of stuff that's pegged, you know, contracts that are pegged to what prices are at the last day of trading. Right. You know, one thing that some traders are saying is that, uh, that it might be calmer than expected on a day like this after being closed a couple of days. You know, we've got some big events coming up. The election next week, right? You know, as terrible and tragic this uh, hurricane was for the eastern seaboard and for New York in particular, medium term, longer term, stocks are going to be looking at what happens with, in the election, what the outcome of the election is. Right. And some of the jobs figures that are coming out, you know, kind of what is the economic growth that we're going to be expecting, you know, kind of how is the economy continuing to improve? So traders are probably not going to want to build up big positions now before then. Yeah. And, you know, here in New York, um, it seems like as far as everything uh, trading is concerned is going very smoothly. I think the bigger issue is for a lot of traders actually getting into downtown Manhattan. Still a lot of people don't have their power. There's some buildings down there that house major banks that aren't up and running. So those logistics need to be worked out over the coming days. You know, it's really a block by block uh, thing where some blocks are fine. Now, the New York Stock Exchange does have uh, generators working on backup power, so it's not like they're on the grid and other people are on the grid. But, you know, some places were flooded. They were just a little bit closer to the water. They had more problems. Uh, the New York Stock Exchange was not flooded. So, yeah, the next, you know, it's going to take a while for things to really get back to normal. But it's probably a good sign for investors, for the markets, that the markets are uh, open today and so far seem to be operating smoothly. And, and a great psychic benefit for New York, important to get the markets up and running. Absolutely, because so much of the city, you know, kind of is focused on the financial district. Thanks for coming on, Larry. My pleasure. Turning to Washington, the federal government will play a major role in the recovery efforts. There is a flood insurance program that it runs through FEMA, and Ed Wyatt in Washington has the details. Hi, Ed. Good morning. So um, your story this morning focuses on flood insurance, which is obviously the big issue here in the wake of Sandy. Um, tell us uh, what the effects are on this, uh, of this storm as it relates to the insurance industry. Well, this is a program that was started in the Johnson administration uh, to offer affordable insurance in coastal areas where private insurance companies couldn't afford to do the insurance or they couldn't do it at a price that consumers uh, could afford. So. Now we have a lot of properties that were destroyed in coastal areas. Uh, some of them were insured. Uh, in all likelihood, many of them were not. Uh, there were probably a lot of people who thought their homeowner's policy covered floods, uh, which it does not. And it's not just coastal areas. Uh, flooding uh, in any area, as we saw a year ago when uh, Tropical Storm Lee and Hurricane Irene hit the Northeast, uh, a lot of places get flooded. Uh, people who don't have flood insurance, even though in some circumstances, if they live in floodplains, they're required to. Yeah. Now, uh, you mentioned Tropical Storm Lee and Hurricane Irene. Um, in the wake of that, uh, of those storms, it seems like a lot of people did get um, additional flood insurance. So are, are we, do we have a situation now that people learn from the last time? 
Well, there definitely are some people, I think, who did learn, or at least who uh, took the requirement that they have flood insurance uh, seriously. We saw an increase of about 7% in Pennsylvania, uh, increases of uh, 3% in New Jersey and New York, uh, the number of policies written. So a lot of people have them. If you buy a federally insured, uh, if you get a federally insured mortgage on a house uh, that's in a floodplain, you're required to buy flood insurance. Uh, at the closing, uh, the lender usually checks, uh, but the, the check doesn't uh, go on after that. So when that policy expires in a year or two, usually, well, not sometimes people don't renew them and they end up in a disaster without flood insurance. We really don't know how many people don't have flood insurance in these areas. Hmm. And then just help us understand, I guess there have been some changes in the law at the federal level. Um, there was some concern that a lot of the people that were benefiting from federal flood insurance programs were wealthy homeowners with beachfront properties. That's what critics of the program have long said. And Congress for a long time uh, would not renew the program for an extended period. They uh, had 30-something uh, short-term extensions of the program. Uh, last year, or, or earlier this year, finally, Congress uh, uh, got a bill through and the President signed it. And what that does is allow for premium increases of 25 percent a year on second homes, on, uh, on homes that have uh, major additions uh, made to them, uh, and some others that uh, are designed to get the uh, premiums up to a market rate. And when you do that, then private insurers can come in and also start offering coverage, and that will take more of the burden off of the federal government, which the flood program itself is not secure by any means. It has $18, million, $18 billion in debt left over from Katrina. And that, uh, for an insurer, that is a big uh, liability. Okay, Ed, well, thanks so much for coming on this morning. Okay, thank you. With power outages across the eastern seaboard, a major concern has been disruptions to internet and wireless services. Quentin Hardy filed this report from San Francisco. Hurricane Sandy showed once again how our futuristic systems sometimes are balanced on a few old things that can fall apart pretty easily. On Monday night, when the ocean invaded lower Manhattan, it flooded out basements that destroyed power to a number of computer servers, destroying services for outfits like the Huffington Post and Gawker and BuzzFeed and a lot of other downtown media as well, ad agencies and design studios in particular. Those guys went black for a while and then they had to scramble and find other services outside the state or further upstate, somewhere else they could go while people dealt with these enormous generators that have been shut down by the flood. The problem here is power. When a computer server is cut off from power quickly, the data gets wiped out and it's all destroyed. Even when they go to an emergency generator, they usually advise you to shut down slowly and carefully or move to a server somewhere else because you don't know how long the generator is going to last. Right now that's true for a whole lot of services in New York City and they're scrambling to figure out what to do with it. Now the really big companies, they move all of their data all the way to Arizona ahead of time. They even fly people to Arizona to work with the data over there until the hurricane is passed. The systems are very ad hoc. They've been invented by this company and that company. You have some documentation in this building and some in that building. But when the power goes, everything goes. Sometimes they back things up, but you can lose the last couple of seconds. And if you're a financial company, that can mean millions of dollars in transactions just go missing. Of course, another dimension of this is just as you have networks of computers, you now have networks of people. And places like BuzzFeed or the Huffington Post or even a lot of reporters at the New York Times are going to be working at home for days and weeks while we get the power going downtown, while we get the water out of all the subway tunnels. And services will go on. Businesses will continue. And that's the upside of having the Internet around. Bad news for homeowners is good news for construction workers. Catherine Rampell is here from our business desk to talk about that. Hey, Catherine. Hello. So a tiny silver lining uh, from this storm is you've been calling around the tri-state area, speaking with contractors and landscapers. And what are you finding? Well, so a lot of them were in very dire shape in the last few years. You know, ever since the housing bust, now about five years ago, um, they've lost a lot of jobs. About two million jobs had been lost. They were not getting a whole lot of new business. 
But as you said, you know, all of this destruction for homeowners, for um, commercial properties, that sort of thing, has required a huge um, demand for their services. So a lot of these places are finding that their phones are ringing off the hook, just you know, requesting that people come over and pick trees out of their houses or um, pump water out so they can rebuild basements and all sorts of other things like that. Yeah, in the same way this morning I saw um, some livery cab drivers and others aggressively seeking out customers because uh, uh, mass transit is closed. Uh, you suggest that there are actually landscapers, contractors going out there handing out yeah. business cards. Yeah, so so some of the more established ones are getting their you know getting phone calls from their existing customers, people they've worked with before. Um, but others are sort of driving around these waterlogged areas, handing out business cards, or just hoping that the presence of their truck with their logo and their phone number will attract more business. So and, yeah, yeah, and, and one of the problems uh, you suggest is that these guys don't have enough workers so they lost so many workers because the housing market had collapsed and people went to do other jobs get right, or a they job left at the Walmart area. or whatever yeah. it was and now they're looking around they say we need heavy construction right so I, I spoke for example with one uh, restoration company in the Outer Banks of North Carolina and the owner of that was saying that like 60 to 70 percent of the people who had worked in the construction industry several years ago had left during the recession. Um, and so she was really concerned about finding people quickly enough, especially since it's still difficult to, to get people into those areas, you know, because streets are still flooded and, it, and it's hard to, to manage transportation. So she was concerned about being able to find people because, you know, the demand for those types of workers had just fallen off. Yeah, and I guess in some cases, you know, these are people that have seen uh, problems from Hurricane Irene and Tropical Storm Lee, and now they're up at it again trying to redo their homes or whatever it is. It's right. Tragic. I mean, certainly the customers that they're finding are not so happy about needing to reemploy all of these construction workers, right? Their, their loss is someone else's gain, but it's still a huge loss. Um, but the construction companies themselves and, and I'm sure the workers who are probably going to end up um, attracted back to these areas, you know, like, like I said, there had right. been sort of a diaspora where people who had worked on the Outer Banks of, of North Carolina or on the Jersey Shore or wherever else there was a whole lot of building during the boom um, had left, had gone elsewhere. Some of them took jobs um, at Walmart, wherever else, but a lot of them had left. So there is a hope that many of these people will come back. Right. Um, and finally have work to do. Yeah, it'll be interesting to watch. Thanks so much for coming on. Thank you. With thousands of flights canceled uh, in airports around New York City, they're slowly returning to life. Stephen Farrell from Metro was on the ground at LaGuardia this morning and filed this report. This is Stephen Farrell for the New York Times at LaGuardia Airport. It's just after dawn and the airport's closed. Police are sealing off the roads all around it. Only workers at the airport are allowed through. We spoke to two of those workers this morning, a couple of electricians who turned up on spec. They didn't come to work yesterday, they didn't come to work the day before, but they thought they'd try this morning. They got in, they walked past the mounds of refuse that were thrown up onto the grass all around the airport from the bay, uh, but there was, they said there were very few people around inside. Uh, they couldn't find anybody to tell them where to work, if to work, so they gave up after 20 minutes and went home. Yes, uh, there's still water on the runway. And uh, even though the water may dry within a few hours, uh, we love our customers and uh, we wouldn't want to risk. We we'll wait for the engineers to come and test uh, the runway and prove it safe. A good 10, 15, 20 feet up from the level of the water now, there's this rim of what looks like moraine thrown up by a glacier. Uh, these bottles, buoyancy devices, uh, rotten fruit, uh, soft drink cans, everything, all the refuse from the bay. That's all for now. We'll be back at 1 p.m. to take a look at the presidential election. I'm Peter Latman, reporting for Business Day Live. Thanks for watching. As New York struggles to deal with an out-of-commission transit system, we'll leave you with a peek inside a dispatch center from a car uh, from Erica Bernstein. Yeah, any family car service, I can help you. Yes. Could your father talk to me, big boss? He's been very, very intense. La 9999, brother, for away, copy. Oh, yeah, definitely. I'll definitely have drivers on. 112, how can I help you? 112. La 39, 39, 9, 10. Last. Copy, yes, you know, everyone. I'm going on 149 West, 105, going on Brooklyn, copy number 9, Andres Sedan, 3rd Avenue, 86. Andres Sedan, regular copy. We only had about like 80 drivers close to what we usually have, but we had more calls than ever. They've been working hard out there.
a lot of flooding, a lot of tree, felt. But we get used to it because we're coming from the Caribbean. And this is not the first time I see a hurricane. Not too happy for go to work now because I don't, I don't like stuck in traffic. The road close highway, major highways and tunnels and bridge. But in the city, we moving pretty good. I think it's going to take a lot to come out of this. You know, we're lucky that we can call new family, and I think yellow cabs have been plentiful, but overall, like our ma basic mode of transportation is, is subway and, and city buses, so I'm not sure how the city's going to survive without our public transportation. I don't know what we're going to do.